Hello friends and welcome to another episode of Reality Check. Our age is dominated by the ephemeral and the transient. Cultural deconstruction runs rampant and looming nihilism seems to engulf all meaning and existence itself. Yet the transcendent still manages to break through. Here at Reality Check we inquire how to conserve the real in a time of deconstruction. In the intricate tapestry of human behavior, habits serve as the threads that weave together our daily lives, from the formation of um, virtuous routines to the allure of nefarious deeds. Habits shape the essence of human existence, reflecting the intricate interplay between nature and nurture. With me today here is a specialist in habits and habituation, Father Ezra Sullivan. Um, joining in from Rome, he's a Dominican friar of the Providence of Saint Joseph. Sorry, Province of Saint Joseph in the United States and professor of moral theology and psychology at the University of St. Thomas Aquinas in Rome um, for the connoisseurs known as the Angelicum. He has published numerous books and articles on topics such as habituation, bioethics, artificial intelligence, moral theology, and ecclesial history, including his very thick and thorough monograph on habits and holiness. So thank you, Father Ezra, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Now, uh, I feel like we have a lot to talk about, but I want to start with the kind of first things first, which is, um, what are you doing in Rome? How did you get there? And what does your kind of future look like at the moment? Well, I've been in Rome for 10 years now, and I teach at a university run by Dominican friars. I'm a member of the Order of Preachers. And primarily, I teach moral theology. I also, from time to time, teach a class on psychology. So after 10 years of being here, now I've started to work a bit on canon law, and I'm currently writing a, a license thesis on how precedence operates with respect to law in the church. So this has to do with tradition and law and whether or not um, there's any value in the past laws of the church. So that's, that's the direction I'm going right now. Okay. Well, the, the idea of, of precedence is obviously very important for, um, especially for the Anglo-Saxon legal mindset, right? Um, whereas the many of the continent, like mm, France and Germany, having a constitution is a little bit differently. But how does, it, how does it work in the church? Can you give us just a brief kind of summary of what you come to at this, at this point anyways? Yes, it, it, exactly. So continental law more or less follows uh, Roman law all the way going back to the ancient Roman system that Justinian created. And church law, canon law, follows the same statutory emphasis. So, so for instance, in Germany in the 19th century, there was an attempt to unite Roman law with, with German uh, local practices. Mm -hmm. And they created a very logical system that more or less the rest of Europe followed, albeit with local differences. So now canon law follows this as of 1917. And what it means is that there's very little tradition within the legal system itself. The Pope is seen as a potentate who could determine law simply by his own will immediately. Mm -hmm. And it actually, unfortunately, can sometimes lead to a loss of a sense of rootedness in the past. And so as Catholics, we want to see, well, what are the powers that the Pope has juridically? But then also, what is the value of these long-standing traditions, which may no longer have legal power? And so that's what I'm exploring in, in my canon law uh, dissertation. Very nice. Very interesting. Okay, well, I, I'm, I'm sure that we'll have another conversation about that uh, in depth in the, in the near or far future, depending on how, how your work progresses. Um, so when... What I find really interesting in the book of uh, on habits that you wrote, and it's it's quite it's quite the it's quite the the, the chunky book. Um, but what I find really interesting is that you don't just you know you don't just have philosophical or theological speculation or even just historical analysis, but you bring in a whole set of a kind of, a kind of biochemical and also psychological evidence, which I find that's a really interesting intersection, right? Because um, oftentimes the philosophers sit in their kind of cloud castle and come up with all of the ideas but they don't really test it in, with, you know, the empirical evidence where psychologists or kind of biochemists, you know, do their, <laughs> their evidence-based research, but oftentimes they don't really see the necessary 
but they don't necessarily see the large implications of of their particular findings. So now these are obviously two gigantic fields. Um, did you feel overwhelmed trying to draw those together, or how did you approach all of that? Well, first of all, I, I would have to say you're, you're very kind in calling me an expert, and um, I would say I'm I'm an amateur in the best sense of the word. Is I, I love the topic of habituation, and really I'm just still trying to understand this this extremely important but often neglected topic in human behavior. Um, mm -hmm. for Fortunately, when I was doing my doctoral research, I partnered with a Franciscan who had received a grant from Templeton, and he brought into Rome a number of experts on neuropsychology. And so for a number of years, I was able to work with them. They sort of put me through the paces and helped me to understand the, the biological underpinnings of how our mind operates. So mm -hmm. I, I myself am not a biologist, but I was able to draw upon their work and then do some secondary research myself in order to try to put together exactly as you say this issue of virtue theory which stems back to aristotle and aristotle has his own biological theories but then also to try to unite it with more or less empirical psychology mostly on the behaviorist level and so uniting these is kind of a bridge that thomas aquinas affords he mm -hmm. is interested in the biology of his day and yet, of course, that needs to be updated in light of what we know now about the brain and different hormonal affect that we, because of our emotions. Mm -hmm. Would I mean, one could argue, and this is what I feel um, many people would say, though, that many of these ancient theories um, of human behavior or of, of action or even of ethical action, what you know, constitutes a good action, all and, 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 and those kind of questions, um, you know, how can we even treat them as significant if the biology that was behind those theories is outdated at this point? So, like, how do you reconcile that? How can we say, well, we can still look for people and, and you know, um, at people like Aristotle or, or Aquinas for answers while the biology is, well, their biology was outdated or faulty uh, at, at times? How do you answer that? Well, let's let's take a, a very concrete emotion, and then we can look at how a virtue might relate to it, and then where does biology come in? So, okay. for instance, we can take the emotion of anger, mm -hmm. and um, according to Aristotle, and then Galen, Aquinas follows them. It has to do with a boiling of the blood, mm -hmm. and and um, and Aristotle recognizes that there are physiological changes when a creature, whether a human or even some animals, human, have anger. The heart starts to beat faster. So this is why he thinks the blood is boiling, because you start to feel this pulsation. Your face might become red, depending on how angry you are. Now, the precise mechanisms of how that anger is, is operating, we obviously know quite a lot more that it's not so much a boiling of the blood that would kill you, um, but there is an increase of temperature. There is a greater blood flow. We can talk about the endorphins that come along from having anger. But the primary importance of anger is is not so much the physiological side, which is helpful, but mm -hmm. it's it's rather the actual action that's happening within you, namely that people feel angry because they feel slighted or that something that they love is being attacked. And so mm -hmm. they want to respond to this way, you know, the, the angry mother bear or mm -hmm. um, you're, you know, you're driving and someone almost hits your car. Why are you angry? Well, because your life is perhaps threatened. So once we recognize the essence of anger, which is the same, no matter what physiological foundation you have to explain it, mm -hmm. then you can start to say, well, well, then is there a moral value to anger? Is it something you just have to be stoic instead of the side? Or, mm -hmm. or is there something that um, can be ut utilized? Can mm -hmm. anger somehow contribute to a greater moral life? And these are questions that Aquinas deals with perhaps better than anybody else has ever written about them. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so what we want to do then is to say, well, operating on the biological level, there's this fundament anger does have to do with your physiology. And by understanding that, it's going to help you to know how to how to adjust your anger or to calm it down. But the essence of the anger is something that can't be identified simply on the physiological scale. Mm -hmm. 
because um, the, the, the cost would be, as you said, for example, your, you know, um, your reaction to something that has been said or maybe a threat or maybe some event where you encounter, well, a potential threat at least, right? So in, in traffic or something, or you see an injustice, I guess, right? Traffic, like traffic rage, right? You see an injustice happening. And so the, the let's say the, the immaterial cause is, um, is the response to that threat, right? Do I get this right? Yeah, so so, the, so the, there you, you can say the efficient cause of anger is whatever the circumstances are. The material cause, in a way, is your physiognomy and how your body is responding to that perception of potential threat. But then the, the key is the formal cause, that which you perceive to be a threat to your life. And mm -hmm. so the formal cause is, um, for human beings anyway, it's it's a psychological perception of danger that mm -hmm. you then need to respond to. For animals, um, they estimate that there's a danger. And so, you know, sometimes like you see a dog growling, it, it seems angry, but mm -hmm. it's just an estimation. The dog can be wrong. The dog isn't going through a sort of recognition of what the precise element is. It could, it's simply, its intuition is a little, um, what we might say, it's, it's imprecise. Whereas for human beings, like we can be angry about a purely, a purely psychological thing. You know, like the, the classic um, person who uh, wakes up and is angry at their spouse because of something that their spouse did in the dream. Like there wasn't any you know, physical <laughs> exterior <laughs> cause for this, um, right. but it's, it's, it's a purely mental uh, reality. So, yeah, so sometimes there are efficient causes outside of us. But for human beings, the primary issue is how are you perceiving that threat or potential threat? OK, so, I mean, in a sense, we could say that that uh, Aquinas was not is not behind um, our times, but he was actually quite ahead of his time, because now where we have the scientific um, methods that can dive into the empirical element of all of that research, we actually see something that has been said, well, now a little bit over 700 years ago, and we can see that reaffirmed, right? Right, exactly. So, so once we know the definition of the of the different emotions, and we know the definition, say, of the virtues, then you can go and look at what what is the physiological evidence for that, and then you can start to notice how these things match up. But if you mm -hmm. don't have a good definition, often even say the the psychological sciences start to become quite untrustworthy. So, for mm -hmm. example, um, if if you're looking, say, for uh, psychological bias. And this is something that happens quite a lot in uh, some psychological studies like, oh, do you have a bias against a certain category of people? Well, mm -hmm. if I ask you about it, then you can tell me yes or no, but that's not hidden bias. It's right. that's your like explicit thought. What they, right. what they try to find is whether your bias is um, something that's unknown to you. So then what they'll do, you know, like, so some of the studies to try to find bias, for instance, mm -hmm. We'll show you photos of a certain kind of person, and then they'll like have you you know, measure. Do you think this person is dangerous or not dangerous? Do you think this kind of person is intelligent or unintelligent? And 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 they they make you choose so quickly that you can't walk through um, a syllogistic argument. It's your immediate response. Okay, now let's suppose all this is happening, but the trouble is that they're only um, the only the test subjects are from a certain say. Uh, group. So let's suppose that you know they're they're studying everybody from Oxford, and you know, do you think um, somebody f not from Oxford is intelligent or is dangerous or whatever like that? But what they don't bother to do is look at non-Oxfordians and see how did they have implicit bias. So so mm -hmm. the very foundation of the empirical argument is only as strong as their premises and the way they design their argument in the first place. And um, so if if they're only looking one sample size, they say. Oh, uh, lots of people from Oxford are you know quite um, quite biased against one group or another, not realizing that actually everybody has an implicit bias, and this is a part of the human race. And this is where Aquinas comes in. He says the reason why we have implicit judgments is because we've been habituated in such a way as to make the judgments more efficient. How do okay. I tell if there's something dangerous or not? When you're a child, is you just have to go by is it you know. Um, is it something that I'm used to or not used to? If it's something mm -hmm. I'm used to, then I make this efficient judgment and like I might be wrong, just like the dog. And mm -hmm. then I can I can correct that by means of reasoning. 
And so I can overcome whatever implicit judgment I've had that in its first instance was not precise. And now it becomes more precise by means of reasoning. Whereas people who study implicit bias, one, they often um, have like just a very small sample and they say, oh, these people have bias and we're not going to look and see whether those other people have bias too. But the other mm -hmm. thing is they, they, the key thing that they miss that Aquinas picks up on is Aquinas says human beings are educable. You can learn something. You can learn to overcome an implicit judgment that's incorrect. And this is mm -hmm. what education ought to be all about is right. exposing whatever judgments you have and then now analyzing them in light of reason. And, um, and so, so helpfully what he does is he shows us these habitual tendencies that we have. And then we're able to identify those. And now we can become educated about them in light of what we know about the greater world. So unfortunately, a lot of habitual studies will just look at a very narrow band of habits. And mm -hmm. they're not seeing it in light of all of human powers or even in light of human teleology, where we're ultimately headed for our own happiness. Hmm. Okay. So, um, so... Then in this study of habits and in this formation of habits, I mean, I'm sure that there are, that there are good habits and bad habits, right? So because, I mean, first of all, what, what is a habit? Maybe we should start with that. Um, what, what is a habit? What is, how, how is a habit different from just an action, an act? Yeah, so a, a habit, the way that Aristotle would define it and Aquinas would follow him, says that it is an, a quality that has been added to the human soul mm -hmm. that inclines us toward some kind of act. And so this quality is stable. It's almost like a second nature. And it, it's empowering us to perform an action, although with conscious decision, you can choose to hold that habit back. So it's still within our power to correspond to the habit or not to correspond. But essentially, it's this quality of the soul inclining us in some direction. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and it's a quality that we can add to our soul. That seems very strong to me. Well, so some habits, they will reside, as it were, in one of our lower powers. You know, so for instance, um, you can have a habit of, um, of, you know, when you eat, you enjoy a certain kind of food. In fact, mm -hmm. they've done studies. This is really interesting that mm -hmm. um, children, when they're in the womb of their mother, if the mother eats a certain kind of food with regularity, after the child is born, then that child will like that kind of food. So they, they did one test group of mothers with carrots. And, um, and, you know, this mother, she was eating something like, you know, a kilo of carrots, like every other day, just a huge amount of carrots. And, um, and after this infant, you know, it was like soon after it was born, then they give it, you know, creamed carrots. And that infant loved it much more than the, you know, the infant that whose mother did not have carrots at all. Oh. They say, okay, so we're habituated from the womb, physiologically, towards some things. That's just the way it is, physiologically. But in order for the habit to become human, choice okay. has to enter in. And now you have to um, choose to correspond to that habit. It becomes not just a physiological habit, it becomes a human habit. So unless your choice enters into that inclination, we would say, well, it's either an instinct if it's natural, it's physiological if you're born with it, or it's innate, but that doesn't make it a human habit per se. It still is on this lower level, just like I can habituate a dog to, you know, run after sheep or something like that. And that yep. doesn't make it a human habit. It's still an instinctual. So it's kind of unreflective in a way, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and so those habits, so, and I, I mean, I assume <laughs> we can talk about good habits and bad habits, right? So we can have uh, inclinations towards good actions and also, well, an inclination that brings us to repeatedly doing a good, um, a good action, or maybe that our first thought goes into a positive way or so that, you know, we see somebody trip on the street, then our reaction is not going to be, Oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm reluctantly walking by because I don't want to be dealing with this um, nuisance right now. Or my first, um, um, my first reaction could be, I must help this person, right? And I and I jump, you know, to 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 help them up, uh, for example. But they can, I'm, I'm sure that they can also be bad habits. Um, that you know, I don't know when when I uh, I don't know. I look at a beautiful woman and I and I kind of just think of her in a sexual way, 
right? Not seeing the person first, but seeing the attractiveness first, and maybe even reducing the person to attractiveness. So that would be a bad habit, I assume. And I mean, this is something that obviously by doing repeatedly um, will somehow leave a mark on us. Is that is that right? Yeah. So the, the way that Aquinas says uh, to measure habits, the first way is according to nature. If if the habit perfects your nature, mm -hmm. if it helps you to be more human and mm -hmm. to lead toward the end that human nature uh, is directed, you know, so toward happiness and ultimately toward beatitude, then mm -hmm. it's a good habit. If the habit is somehow destructive of your nature, whether of a particular power or of your teleology as a whole, then it's going mm -hmm. to be a bad habit. So, so he doesn't measure habits necessarily by their outcomes or by being in accord with some kind of positive human law. It, you know, this is definitely not a Kantian idea of, mm -hmm. um, oh, it's my good habit is to obey the law. Actually, what it is, is it's, it's an interior principle, this quality that's expressing itself, that's creatively responding to these situations that perfects me and it's going to perfect my neighbor according to our nature. So, okay, so an evil habit, then you perform one bad action, something that is you know, contrary to the good of your nature in some way. Um, mm -hmm. You look at another person and that other person, um, you're not seeing them in the fullness of their humanity. You're reducing them to an object. Um, it's not just that violates some like external rule. It's that that's contrary to your own dignity because it actually is a limitation of your imagination. You're not even seeing this person as... Mm -hmm a wise person would see them within their whole human uh, person as a whole. Mm -hmm. So what that does, though, you do it one time, maybe it's a mistake, or maybe you're not thinking about it very much. You do that over and over again, your inclination will be to start to see people as objects and not as human persons. Mm -hmm. and, and then this actually starts to degrade your own dignity. Because now sure. you're not even seeing truth or reality as as it truly is. You're seeing within a narrow band of your own self-interest, and that actually leads to diminishment of your person. So, so each habit that we have, whether good or bad, ends up affecting us. I always like to use the image of, um, you know, gardening or a tree. That um, when when a tree is small, it can be very flexible, and then as the tree grows, its its branches will become more and more fixed because they're harder and harder to shape. And this is essentially what we're doing to ourselves is we're shaping our own organic interior life. And if you if you perform a bad habit continually, it's going to twist the branches of your soul. So it's no longer open to the light that it should be. OK. OK, that, 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 is, that is the interesting image indeed. Um, now, OK, the way that you explain it, um, I, I'm, I'm thinking if I can push back a little bit here, but the way that you explain it seems to be that um, in order to qualify um, and to discern between good habits and bad habits, the whole argument kind of hinders upon what human nature is. So, I mean, can we know what human nature is in essence? Well, um, not from empirical st studies, no. Um, the whole idea of behaviorist psychology is that you can um, predict people's behavior, you can manipulate people's behavior, and you don't mm -hmm. even have to, have to know anything about the human soul or mm -hmm. what the human being is. So mm -hmm. behaviorist habituation has been employed in, for instance, the creation of the cell phone. That when mm -hmm. they were designing, when Apple was originally designing this little glowing rectangle with little specks on it that you can push around with your finger, the whole idea was to make you addicted to it. And frankly, that is why now they're ubiquitous, that within a matter of you know, 10 years of the cell phone existing, the smartphone, everybody in the world has one. People might not even have a house, but they have a smartphone. Right. Um, why? Because they understand the habituation that is involved with addiction. The trouble is that they overlooked the fact that this could be a diminishment of the human being because they, they're not seeing the human being habituated in terms of the fact that we have a soul and we have this eternal teleology that we're pointed toward a horizon that's above this world. Mm -hmm. So so it's true that in a certain respect, um, you can habituate yourself to some kinds of actions, 
Mm-hmm. But in, in a deeper respect, we would say that to have this interior principle that you yourself are responsible for, mm-hmm. the one that dignifies yourself, you have to, as it were, be a cooperator in your own self-shaping. And that means that you do have to understand what is human nature? What does it mean to have an intellect? What does it mean to have a will that can love? What does it mean to have you know, a heart with courage and so on? So so a diminishment of habits um, can lead you to addiction. Um, but the true full understanding uh, requires this this deeper apprehension of human nature. Do, do, do you think what, while things are falling, um, do you think um, while I think the, the easy example would be um, that we could get addicted to bad deeds? Do you think we can actually get addicted to good deeds? <laughs> I suppose it depends on what do you mean by addiction. Um, <laughs> you know, can I be addicted to oxygen? Well, no, because oxygen is natural. It's good for my physiology. Um, mm-hmm. But but there's a very interesting thing that Aquinas says, and this is I, I, you're touching on something very important. Namely, he says, as people become habituated to the good, mm-hmm. it becomes more difficult for them to do something that's truly evil. Mm-hmm. Because when you're habituated to the good, it's natural. It, it, it's, it's a natural expression of, mm-hmm. of yourself. Mm-hmm. And habits are like second nature. And so someone who actually loves the good and finds joy in the good, like, okay, let's say that you, you know there's a married man, he loves his wife, and maybe from time to time they have little problems, but overall he, he still is in love with her after all of these years. It will be very difficult for him to to uh, cheat on her compared to a man who doesn't love his wife and mm-hmm. he fights with her and he hates her and secretly you know fantasizes about stabbing her in the eyeball well if, clearly the person who has the habitual love it'll be much more difficult for him to overcome that love and to do something wicked contrary to his wife and so this is where aquinas is very wise in saying that not only is say addiction toward evil something that chains us up he actually describes it as like a katana a, a chain that goes around you he says mm-hmm. actually good habits are strengthening and it becomes difficult to not have that strength mm-hmm. hmm. that's very interesting would you um so this actually this brings up something i mean you you obviously you know you're, you're catholic priest you're, you're researching um mostly um in that realm and you teach um at a pontifical university but i wonder in your contact with the secular literature did you encounter um, these kind of realizations that are like kind of on their own um, or standing on their own? And, and maybe, you know, where you find, um, well, the, the, the research that points towards this type of understanding of human nature and habituation, but that doesn't really know what to do with it. Or do you find that this is really just confined to, let's say, religious circles? Um, what's your experience with that? Yeah, no, so certainly um, there's there's been you know, even popular books written about um, the addictive nature of, um, I mean, not just say uh, you know, drugs or something like that, but the Internet or um, phones, technology. And and often there's a, a very thin kind of anthropology. They have difficulty describing um, why this is a problem, but they, but they recognize that for teenagers, for instance, to be on their cell phones for such a long time actually leads to smaller brains, uh, fewer connections made between between the cells of the brain, and mm-hmm. then it's going to lead to long term consequences in terms of the viability of them having jobs, of their um, uh, interest in having friends, their ability mm-hmm. to make like long term emotional connections. So mm-hmm. certainly, there's a lot of recognition that addiction is problematic, but the explanation for why it's problematic. And what mechanisms psychologically are going on, those often are, as it were, set to the side. It's a black box. Um, we know if we put if the input into the box is too much technology, the output is going to have all these negative consequences. But what's going inside the box? Well, often that's not explained. Very, very interesting. Um, this reminds me of, and I don't know where I heard or read this, but the, the story of, of two children, one had very kind of intricate toys. And, and, and a bunch of them, and, and another one, this is toddler age, and another one just had like a block of wood. Um, and it ended up that the child with a block of wood had actually a much more, much higher and more sophisticated developed uh, creativity 
Um, well, because he had to make do with this block of wood, and this block of wood had to be everything. It had to be an airplane, it had to be a ship, it had to be a boat, it had to be a, you know, a car. Whereas the child with all of the really elaborate toys um, was basically just consuming the already existing, you know, kind of pluriform variety of toys. But therefore, its own creativity um, was, well, was left you know, shriveled, right? So, um, I don't know, maybe it's comparable to that a little bit. Um, but I like, so, your, so do you, like yeah, your black box you're, idea. you're touching on something that Plato talks about when um, he talked about the, the, he gave a parable about uh, the danger of writing. And, you know, there's this Egyptian parable that said um, people were worried that if you wrote down what you know, right, then it becomes exteriorized. Yeah. And the trouble is that you have exteriorized memory, which means I don't have to interiorize whatever that information was. And I'm not even having an interior insight anymore. Now it's contained in this exterior technology. And, and so the trouble with uh, the computer, especially for infants, is it's an entirely exteriorized world. And so everything um, on the computer is it, all that means is that the child can be passive with respect to all of that information, all of the um, engagement that's happening, it's its created by many, many different intellects all at once. And so the child can simply absorb whatever that is. Whereas the block of wood, the there's almost no information there that the child now has to respond by developing the synapses within his brain in order to make sense of what this block could be. And so, so this is always going to be a problem with with uh, information embedded exteriorly in technology, is mm -hmm. that um, you have this this laziness that the brain always is going to do because you're like, well, efficiently the brain always wants to choose the things that um, it doesn't have to do. You don't have to put a lot of work into it. So, uh, mm -hmm. if, if the book contains the information, I don't have to know it. It's in the book. But the trouble is, if you're surrounded, well, here I am, surrounded by books. Um, it can be it can be a way actually to avoid interiorizing any of the information whatsoever. Now imagine you have an infinite library and all the books come alive and talk at you. Now you have the internet, and and so what this leads to is the lack of development of synapses. You have smooth brains, people who are no longer learning at all, and all they're doing is they become as it were like a passive channel for what they've heard. So they're evil, easily propagandized and um, they have very little insight into the kinds of things that they're parroting. Yeah. No, that's, it's, it is, it is so true. And I actually have this um, in a very small way, but I know this from personal experience. So when I, um, when I try to come up, you know, with things that I need to pick up at the shop, I have to work, for example, and it's it's not a lot. It's maybe five or six things, but it's five or six things, right? And I and I try to memorize them throughout the day so that I I and you know you kind of walk through. It's like oh yeah, I need to pick up the, you know there's soap and bananas and whatnot, um and and you remember them, then it is much easier actually to remember them. But when you write them down, um, I find at least when you write them down, then even the memory that you already had for most of the day until that point almost vanishes and then you're in the shop and without the um, without the little paper that you had written it down to or, or whatever on your new phone um i wouldn't be able to remember the six things whereas had i not written it down well i may or may not have forgotten one so then i just buy five things but nonetheless those five things i would have remembered um so i've, I've made this experience uh, multiple times um yeah yes so so what this is pointing to i i think is that we we know that the interiorization of a reality um it means more to us and then you're thinking about it you're using your imagination your imagination helps your memory and and so say going back to goodness for just a second when mm -hmm. people exteriorize goodness goodness is a law that exists outside of me when people mm -hmm. have that kind of attitude they're not um as it were it's not impressed upon their soul Right. And so goodness just becomes like this thing that I can forget because it's already written down somewhere. It's contained mm -hmm. in some book or some law. Civilization requires this of me. But now it's not written on my heart, whereas the yeah. habituation is it becomes a part of who I am. It's so, it's so much a part of me that it's within my memory and imagination and hopefully my will. And so it's it's the humanization or the incarnation of that reality that now persists in a spiritual way within me. Fascinating. 
Um, it kind of makes you frightened living in the modern era, I must say. But um, but that's a different question. Now, it does lead us very neatly over to a second field of um, of uh, of research that you have done, and and that I think is very very fascinating in this regard. Um, and this is the the whole question of AI. Now, I I feel like you have a very peculiar angle at looking at AI. Um, but maybe first, I, I do want to ask, um, how did you get interested in AI? Was that one of those things that you had to do because somebody told you to, or was this something that you found um, intrinsically fascinating? Well, it, it was related to um, my research on human flourishing and habituation. So okay. um, it, it essentially... Because my my first interest was how do human beings come to develop interior principles of action, then you start to think about, well, what happens when you have a computer that has a principle of action, but there's no interior life of a computer. All of right. it is, is physically, literally on a hard drive somewhere, and there's no self-reflection. And mm -hmm. so I started to realize that a robot is is it's like the inverse of a human being is um i don't train a robot there's no organic like, interaction that i have like you know what if i train a dog um it takes time i have to work with the dog it has emotions or you know you have your child you're trying to teach your child something and the organic process of interiorizing whatever principle you want to teach your child or dog like that that um requires a lot of different elements in order to make it happen whereas you put a, you put something into a robot and it instantly, as it were, has that information. And so there's no growth principle there. It's either on or off. It's the binary. And so I was very interested in, as it were, like the phenomenology of robots, if, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. That got me questioning, what is the nature of uh, artificial intelligence? Okay. So, um, well, I guess what, what links this to, to the whole habituation is is that the greatest danger that you see with uh, the development of AI as it is right now? And I'm certainly not up to date on the most recent developments. Um, but is the greatest danger that um, man ex well externalizes um, an action that he should be able to internalize? Is this the greatest danger, or how would you? Yeah, what would you say? Yeah, this 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 is precisely um, how how I started thinking is okay. First, first let's let's suppose before you get to AI, and let's it's kind of like an advanced stage of technology. An earlier right. stage of technology is um, say I have a painting of a human being, or I have a statue of a human being. Mm -hmm. There's um, there's information about a human being that's embedded in say the statue. Okay, mm -hmm. so the, the the look of it, the very shape of the marble is going to have information that was required in order to shape it in a particular manner, look like this statue, not that statue. We call that the formal, you know, the formal difference between one and another. What, what happens when um, human beings now no longer think of themselves as that which possesses wisdom or that, you know, I'm, as a human being, I possess um, an interior principle that dignifies me. What if everything starts to become only embedded in like that statue? The, the result becomes that I actually lose a sense of the difference between me and that thing. Um, maybe, maybe this is, uh, maybe I can use another example. Um, the, uh, the, the, the trouble, the trouble with AI is when people are trying to say, oh, can this can this thing be intelligent? Can I make it into something? They're like, well, there's there's an old Jewish story about maybe the golem. Have you have you are you familiar with this story? Um, yes, I am. Okay, so I mean, just very briefly, in case anybody you know is not aware, is um, there's a rabbi in the 16th century, and he shapes clay into the shape of a man. So it's a statue. He writes the name of God on its forehead, and then this statue comes alive, and it's walking around. And um, so this is this is for me like a parable of um, what it means when we start to not do things in an organic manner, but we try to, as it were, control material property in order to like make it uh, subservient entirely to our will. 
he so he writes the name of the of God on his forehead. Like human beings mm-hmm. are made in the image of God, but the mm-hmm. way that we reproduce ourselves is organic. How do I reproduce my ideas by teaching people? And it takes time to teach people. They have to be habituated to it. They have to, as it were, think through it for themselves. They have to be willing to learn. Whereas you digitize something, you have the statue, you write it on their forehead. It's all there immediately. It's all there in a non-organic, um, controlled process. Hmm. Well, the the end of the story of the golem is that this this statue now, um, with the name of God on its forehead, it starts to rampage the um, the local village where you know the Jewish people lived and starts to kill everybody. Why? Well, because there's a sense in which a false human being is always a challenge to organic human beings. That um, even if it's not like an actual Terminator situation, what it does is it challenges our humanity because we start to forget, like, well, what is the real human being made in the image of God that takes time to grow to, you know, from from nine months in the womb to years of education and lots of annoying behaviors until it becomes like an adult you can have a rational conversation with. Like all of that is embedded in the difficulty of being human. And that's part of how we become human is by treating children in a humane way. Whereas what this is, is a fully formed man that now in this digital process gains its own power. It itself never learned. It is simply given this power. And so what that does, though, is that disempowers us because it, it makes us forget our own organic nature. So anyway, it's it's it kind of a, a complex series of, of concepts that overlap. The result, though, of, of the rampaging golem is that eventually what they have to do is chop its head off and then wipe away the name of God on its forehead. Mm-hmm. And, and this to me is, is recognizing that AI is never human. And so like, how do we, how do we overcome the challenges of these false beings of reason is to, in a way we have to undermine their humanity. We have to say chat GPT is never going to be human. Um, no matter how, how well you make an, an AI digital creation of a photo or of a video or of music, Ultimately, we don't want to be seductively brought into this relationship with this digital world in a way that that obscures our humanity, because it will be a challenge, because then we start to think, well, I don't have to listen to any human composer. I can just listen to AI. I don't have to interact with a human being, with Jan Bentz. I can just have my digital friend. And then suddenly, your humanity is entirely lost. Yeah. Um, I, I think the Golem is actually, it's a great, great example. It's a story that has been told in many, many different ways, but it's actually, it's a, it's a theme, right? The, the artificial human being is, is a theme. So you have it a little bit in Frankenstein as well, but then also, and this is more close to the Golem story, in, uh, in Goethe's Faust, right? Who tries to make the humunculus. Um, and so it's, it's, it's interesting how, especially in that, in the, like the age of, of enlightenment or the, I guess the, the aftermath of the age of enlightenment, these stories were actually, it, it was a repeated theme, right? It was a thematic idea. And I feel that, um, I mean, even with the early kind of Isaac Asimov science fiction, it kind of reappears. Um, but now because, um, our, well, technology is actually so advanced, we give each, uh, we give ourselves the illusion that now it becomes reality. And I always find this, um, this interconnected, um, I don't know what you would call it, like this interconnected self-fulfilling prophecy is so fascinating, right? Um, I, I mean, and you can see this with so much of, uh, of modern inventions, right? And I'm thinking of like, the you know, the like the Elon Musk stuff. Um, it always starts with this super um, high gloss, shiny, you know, video of this amazing uh, of this amazing, I don't know, he, what, what is it, the, the, the bullet, the, the speed bullet, that, that super fast tra- underground train, right? And it looks really cool and it sounds really cool. And you've seen it in movies, right? So, wow, this is just the next step. Um, but the interesting thing is, well, it's the next step. And why do we perceive it as the next step? Uh, we perceive because, well, we've already seen it in movies that predicted the future, so to speak. But then it looks really high gloss and it looks like something that could be catching on and that is really useful. But then you look at the practicalities of it and it, it's not even conceivable. It's actually worse than, you know, having a freight train or having a having an, you know, an airplane bringing the stuff from A to B or um, or in the same way, you know, the. Yeah. Um, so so I, I find this really interesting is that um, we build the or we come up, we come up with these creations 
um, these artificial creations in, 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 in our fantasy first, and then maybe in science fiction and literature first, but then we, we turn them into reality, spurned on by this idea that we gave ourselves and then kind of think, oh, this is going to be the next step of progress. Whereas as you say, it seems to be more a dehumanizing step or a step towards dehumanization. Um, yeah, but the I, I guess the illusion of uh, of the, the 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 robots being so intelligent um, because they're so sophisticated, the illusion is there and it is much stronger, obviously now than it would be during Goethe's time or doing you know when the Golem was written or Frankenstein. I don't know. Does this make sense? Yeah, yeah. I I think that the the myth of progress is predicated on the myth of materialism, and so. Definitely, there's material progress in the sense that you can go from a steam engine to uh, an engine that runs off of gasoline, and now maybe to an electric engine or something like this. And each one is building upon the insights, engineering-wise, of the previous version. So, so that's true progress in a material sense. Um, but, but that's not progress in the deepest sense for humanity, which yeah. is a deepening of each individual's virtue. And so. Progress for humanity is always on the individual scale. It's not as if, as a yeah. society, each each society can become more and more virtuous. In fact, whenever people thought that, then suddenly a world war arises or a great catastrophe um, challenges everybody's virtue, or perhaps there's going to be like this mass genocide. And um, and so whenever something like this arises, it shows that progress has to be on an individual scale. That your own virtue has to increase in light of your relationship with God. And, and this notion that material progress and societal virtuous progress go hand in hand, I think more or less we're in the postmodern stage where people are sort of suspicious about this kind of story. And yet every now and then, um, there's still these sort of idealists that pretend that material progress and social progress and economic process will somehow like come together in this uh, really quasi-communist future where um, if we can just eliminate all the inconvenient people, whoever they happen to be, then um, then suddenly everything will emerge on this higher state of evolution. And and that's just a, a, like obviously a fantasy for people who are, recognize the difference between material and spiritual. But for people who are purely material, they don't have any way to adjudicate these different versions of progress. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's the utopia. Well, I mean, they would have a way, which is history. This has been said and has been tried in history, but oftentimes they don't really see that happening and have happened, right? So they get, um, I guess, fooled by their own utopia. Um, I, I always um, got a, um, well, I don't know, it, it, it was, you know, it would be funny if it were not so real, but um, when, when Yuval Harari in his uh, Homo Deus points out that we have now overcome war hunger and death and and right after i read that a couple of months later you know the, the the ukraine conflict broke out and i'm like hmm, and then israel and you're like hmm, okay have we really overcome all of those things like are you sure is this the status quo that we can now take as a new starting point for you know the the transhumanist phase not so sure about that yeah, and, and and this is one of the worries that that I have um, about artificial intelligence is it's truly artificial, meaning that um, it is it's an artifact, and and so it's artificial in the sense that it's an artifact that's been made, um, and then the other is that it's artificial in the sense that it's fake, and so people who, as it were, um, allow artificial intelligence to make decisions for them, are themselves no longer intelligent. It's 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 I would say it's actually the inverse of what a lot of these hype monsters are trying to convince you of is that we can now enter into a higher stage of intelligence by letting the computers do the thinking for us. Actually, I've seen this over and over again. People who let the computers do the thinking for them are people who don't think. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and so if you're not thinking, something else is doing the thinking for you. And who yeah. and who's doing that thinking? Well, it's the people who programmed the 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 yeah. artificial intelligence in the first place and it's all the information from which the artificial intelligence draws and right. inevitably that's going to be a finite resource that's selected according to criteria of the programmers so yeah. so for instance i some people are creating artificial intelligence so uh priests can create homilies well, what you're going to have is a lot of ignorant priests running around making homilies that all sound like each other 
And, um, and you're like, well, that's really fine to have a bunch of, as it were, robots who um, preach nothing. I suppose there's some masses where they feel like that anyway. Um, but at least there's the possibility of educating a human being. Whereas yeah. artificial intelligence in itself, as I say, it's both an artifact and it's fake. And um, you're not going to get any true progress of the human spirit this way. You're going to have a diminishment of each individual. Yeah. Um, and there, it, it, it almost, I mean, it almost closes the circle insofar as man creates this image, right? Creates something in his image, forgetting in whose image he is created. So he creates something in his image. But then once that's done, since he does not yet have absolute power, mostly over his own life, he actually starts to become like the image and um, the image that he has created. So he, he becomes um, this robotic, mechanized and, well, purely material being, right? So he actually moves further away from his true origin and moves into the direction of his creation, thereby diminishing his own, as you say, his own intelligence, his own um, personhood, in a sense, and his own his own capacities. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and this is said in a theological, poetic manner in sacred scripture, where it says that man becomes like the thing that he worships. And so the man who worships an animal becomes like huh. a beast. Ah, man that, that worships human beings at best he's just humane but the man who worships god becomes godlike so yeah. to to worship the ai is a hall of mirrors where man sees himself but just as in the hall of mirrors the image of the human being recedes into the infinite background your humanity starts to recede in the hall of infinite possibilities of ai you actually lose your humanity in thinking that you're expanding it by all of these mirrors. The person who looks at themselves in the mirror all the time are the people who are the most boring to be around. <laughs> well, and ultimately that's the, the mythological figure of a Narcissus, right? Narcissus, it's the one that looks at the reflection. He's not really interested in the world around him. He's interested in that part of the world in which he sees himself. Yes. And only that part in which he sees himself. So Yeah, so everybody can be an Instagram star where the only people who follow them are the robots. And um, and so they, they, they think that they have crowds of, of admirers, but it turns out all of their admirers are artificial. So they themselves are artificial as well. And, yeah. um, and you know, who wants to hang around an, an Instagram star? Well, only shallow people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I assume that you're not an Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so. Okay. Good. <laughs> very good. Well, Father Ezra, thank you so much. This was very, very. Um, it was delightful to talk to you. Um, delightful to hear your thoughts. Um, and and the fruit of your research that you know took up a significant amount of of time in your life and of of the recent past. So thank you for that. And very enlightening comments. And I'm sure that there is much food for thought. Um, can you direct us maybe, uh, can you direct our listeners to, if we want to read something of yours, what would you suggest? Where would you start? I, I have a popular book on habits um, called Heroic Habits. And, uh, and, and that's, that's a good place to start. So I try to bring in as much scholarly material as I can, but that's all, the, all in the end notes. It's not even within the text. Very accessible, lots of charts. And it kind of gives an overview of the thought of Thomas Aquinas in light of modern biological psychology. So that would be the place to start, heroic habits. Wonderful. Well, I'm, I am I would in, in, encourage everybody to do that, and I will do that myself because that's a book that I don't have of yours yet. So um, so your publisher will be very happy. Thank you, Father Esther, for being with us, and I hope to speak with you again in the future. And you take care and all the best for your work. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs>